So, you got to see this to believe it. This is the, the perfect slide to understand what the market does. Tiny little numbers, don't worry about the tiny numbers, just worry about the trend. That's 31,000 properties on the market in 2007 and about 5,000 properties sold. Huge buyer's market moving into a seller's market, right? The number of sold hasn't gone up much, the number of properties for sale has plummeted. So we get to this point right here and you can't believe that somehow we seem to have sold more properties than we're on the market. I mean, you just can't believe it. Over here, I was certainly saying that that's about as tight as it could ever be and there should be an inflection bounce up from there, maybe getting back to a more normal market. That's what I was thinking a couple of years ago, but it's not what happened. What happened is we hit this right here and this is the spring. This is what we just went through, the January, March, May. Unbelie it simply can't get tighter. It actually makes no sense statistically. It's like San Francisco. It, it does, we've sold more properties than we had on the market. I don't have a good answer for that, except to say when your buyers are saying, wow, how come you can't find any properties for me? Don't take any grief from them. It's not your fault. There are so few properties out there. And of course, if anybody's thinking about selling, well, maybe it's a good time to sell when we have just like no inventory, when everything has come on the market has gone. What I can tell you though is, it seems to me it really can't get much stronger than that. I mean, when you have the same number of properties on the market as sold, I don't know how it can be any stronger. And I think that's what we just went through in the, in the spring, and that's what we're talking about. Maybe we're pulling back a little bit, like John said, from that and getting to just a ridiculously strong market instead of what we saw right here. I love showing people this slide because there's no words on it. You just say, buyer's market, average market, amazing seller's market right here. And that's what we want to do is educate our folks. Any questions on that? What's the red and the blue again? The red and the blue. The blue is the inventory. So it's the active listings on the market per month. So that was about 30,000. That's about 21,000. That's about 17,000 where we think a balanced market is somewhere in here and we were there for about 20 minutes and then we just kept going down, 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 down forever and then we hit this point right here in March, March of 15, we just came in. This is what we were all yapping about saying, how come I can't find any properties? Why are there 18 of you every time I go out and look and do a showing? Because we're all bumping into each other because we were all looking at the same. This is exactly what happens and you can see it's spread up a little bit right now. I'm we're going to see if that's going to spread out a little bit more. That's what that is. Thanks. Yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, looks like the amount of sold homes is about the same for all this time, like 5,000, a little bit more. What happened to all this inventory? Where did they go? So the, she says the amount of sold homes hasn't really changed very much over time. Where has all the inventory gone? I don't know, taken off the market? We're going to talk about that in a few uh, slides. Okay, we're going to, Lon will address that in a couple slides, in a couple of the new slides. Yeah, well, what you see is that what was there was either taken off the market or sold, basically by definition, and by month by month by month, this ate into this, and what happened was new inventory didn't come on the market. So, so for seven years in a row, we've simply had less inventory coming on the market, and now we're getting to the point where we have the same amount of inventory as sold. And Lon will we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Yeah, go for it. yeah, absolutely. So the quick two-minute answer is in 2004, 5, and 6, we had really easy lending, right? Stated income, stated asset. You tell me you make 100 a year, I'll give you a loan for 400,000. You're not bringing any documentation to prove it. So we sold lots and lots of houses in 2004, 05, and 06. How many of you guys remember that? I bought a four-unit apartment building on a 3% down loan, and they let me use my commission as a down payment. You guys remember that? I can't get that loan anymore. So, all those people who should not have bought all gave their buildings and houses back to the banks in 8, 9, and 10, right? So we had this enormous glut of bank-owned inventory. So the builders responded by completely stopping all construction. Because you had this huge glut of bank-owned homes that were being sold at a huge discount. Why would I build something new that's going to be expensive, right? A, and B, none of the banks were very excited about financing anymore and construction at that point either. So what we did is we had to burn off all of that bank-owned cheap inventory, which took us the better part of four years to do. And while we did that, 
nothing got built. Does that make sense? So when we sold all the bank owns, suddenly we had people saying, I'd still like to buy a house and there's nothing available. That's where we're at right now. So we'll go through that a little bit more detail. That's the first quick answer. Sorry. And then, so what we're saying is that these things, they don't change weekly or monthly. Lon was talking about four or five years. You can see it. That's exactly it. This is a seven-year thing going on right here. It can't get any lower. It's going to have to bounce back at some point. But it doesn't happen because Zillow published an article and everybody calls you and says, oh my God, the world's changing. That's one of the things I really try to bring a value to my clients is to get them to calm down a little bit. Just because they read an article in the newspaper and suddenly think they know the market, they need to see history of it and understand that on Tuesday something isn't going to happen. These things tend to go over years and it's really, really important to kind of be the adult in that conversation because people freak out if they don't do this all day every day. This is months of inventory, another way of looking at it. Basically, lots of inventory, buyer's market, here's where we are right now, a seller's market. And what I want you to think is take two or three or four of these slides that you really like and just get comfortable thinking about it and talking about it. So when you have that proverbial elevator conversation or someone asks you how's the market or what do you think I should do, you can pull this information in, whichever one it is. Don't think you need to understand all of this perfectly. But take, a, take something out of this so that you can talk about it with your clients. So this right here, what's been happening since 1971? Well, prices have been going up, mostly, okay? They went up, 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 up. They crashed for a couple of years. This was the end of 14, and this is where we are right now. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous price increase. Are we heading for a bubble? I don't know. It's as simple as that. Will prices come down at some point? Of course. I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. We'll see. But here's an interesting thing to think about. So what you hear people say all the time is prices are too high. They're at all-time highs. They have to come back. I'm sure you've heard that before. So how about this statistic? In the last 44 years, there were only four years that actually had an overall market decrease in price, which means 90% of the time people said prices are too high, they have to go down. They were wrong. Think about that for a second. So like, I love this right here. So in 1976, the average home price was about $40,000 in Metro Denver. And you know what people were saying in 1976? Oh my God, prices have been skyrocketing. Prices have to go down. So we laugh, except we also say the same thing. I don't know if prices are going to go down or not. All I know is that 90% of the time, we've been at all-time highs and prices haven't gone down. And then people talk about the seven-year cycle. What seven-year cycle? Tell me where the seven-year cycle is. It went up for, what's that, 71? So that's about 14 years there. Statistically, it went down for a few years. And then it went up for like 17 years. Forget about the seven-year cycle. I don't know what that is. I don't know where that myth came to be. But it's not that simple. What we know is that prices have been skyrocketing and with the very, very low inventory that we still have, I do expect prices to continue to go up for a while. I think for me, it's all about, whoops, it's all, yes, yeah. it's all about the inventory um, and the inventory is still almost at record low. While we continue to grow as a city, 50,000 new people coming in, and as Lon talked about, we have started more construction, but we're still woefully behind in terms of satisfying the demand for both sales and for rentals. Questions on that? Condos, townhomes, should look pretty familiar. That actually looks a lot like the previous slide. That's single family homes, that's condos and townhomes. So don't have anybody say to you, well condos and townhomes behave completely differently because I just heard this or this person said that or I read something. I look at this and the big broad 44 year statistics say prices went up, prices went down, prices went up. Statistically, they actually went down less than single family homes. Now, I can't quite explain that because I saw the $25,000 condos out there four years ago just like you did, but they actually went down less statistically and they've been skyrocketing. And for the last couple of years, the price increase for condos and townhomes, attached properties, has actually been faster than for homes. But they basically play off each other. It's a very liquid market. I was out yesterday with a client. We were looking at some condos, some townhomes, and comparing the two. You want to do this one or you want me to do it? Oh, I can do it. Okay. Do you want me to take the silver thing so that the uh, yep. audio works as well? So, if you have, who has people worried about we're going into a bubble? Okay. So, Charles gave you the first part. Let's take a look at the price slide. 
And one additional comment, additional piece that might help you out on the price line is that we had this two-year decline, and then we had five years where prices went up to get back to our prior peak. So we really only had two years of price increases in the last decade. I think if you rephrase this in that format, it looks a lot less scary. Does that make sense? We had two or three years of price increases in the last decade. We had a huge decline in the long years to recover. So the other part of your bubble question is this one. The blue line with the steady gentle increase is the population of Denver Metro, and that's on the right side axis. So you can see in 1975, we had about one and a half million people. Today, we have about three million people. Nice steady increase over time. The red line that bounces around is the number of homes that we sold each year. A little bit more volatility on home sales count, depending on the economic cycle. So in the 1970s, we had a really good economy in Denver, so we sold more homes than you would expect relative to the population of the city. The 80s were a terrible time in Denver, huge recession here locally. We didn't sell very many homes at all. I think there were bumper stickers saying, the last person will be in Denver, please turn out the lights. Who was in Denver in the 80s? Was, can you tell me about that? Awful. That's what people always say. So in the 90s, we created a lot of high-tech and telecom jobs that uh, asked people to move to Denver to fill all these jobs, including me, I moved here in 98. Very high paying jobs. We could not build fast enough, either for homes or apartments, with all of the new population of the city, just like today. And the market was very, very down. We sold about the number of homes that you'd expect as the city grew in population. What happened in 04, 05, 06? What's that? Exotic loans. Crazy loans. Anybody can have a loan. My dog got a loan. What a dog So we sold too many. So if you're worried about a bubble, 2005 is what a bubble does look like. We sold way too many homes relative to the population because the easy financing enabled that bad behavior. We had a couple years where we didn't sell very many homes because of this last recession. Recently, you can see that our 2014 sales line was exactly the number of homes you predict based on the population of the city. Does it look like we're going into a bubble? There is zero, zero evidence of a bubble here. None. I can't be any more clear about that. Could we get into a bubble in three or four years? Could happen. I don't know, but at the moment, I don't see it. Questions on that? Okay. So, uh, I've had a lot of people ask, will the increase in interest rates hurt the market? Do the same question like that. All right, I've heard this enough that I built a couple slides for you, so bear with me as I go through these. You're like the first people to suffer through them. Hopefully they're going to work. So on the left-hand side, this is just a replication of the chart that we just looked at. Blue line is the population growth of the city. The red line is the number of home sales. All I did on the right-hand side is I just divided one of them into the other. What's the number of homes sold per thousand people? And what you get is an answer of about 13. On average, we sell 13 homes a year per thousand people who live here. And it bounces around a little bit, as you can see. Last year, we were at about 14, just a smidge above the 40-some year average. Does that make sense? So I think the, the takeaway from this, if you talk to a client, is that the number of homes that you sell in the market is a relatively predictable thing. It should not be considered mysterious. It's mostly a, a function of the population of the number of people who live here. Does that make sense? It has to be, right? Okay, here we have what's the average 30 year mortgage rate for a home over the last 40 some years. So you can see it was really high and it's lowered a whole bunch and recently been turning upwards a little bit. Joe asked you to talk about that a little bit more depth in a minute. So you guys have all seen that slide many, many times, right? Okay, so what we have here on the left is that same slide again. The average mortgage interest rate over the last about 40 years. And on the other side, we have the number of home sales per 1,000 people. Do you see any relationship between these two charts? There is no relationship between mortgage interest rates and the number of homes that you sell when you adjust for population. So let's make it really obvious. So on the left-hand side, right here, this first guy is 1982. The average interest rate for a loan in 1982 was 16 percent. Wouldn't that be fun? And we sold about eight homes per thousand. 
the average long term is 13. So we sold a whole lot less homes in 1982 than you would historically expect. And the rates are really high. All those other dots are all those other years where we just plotted what was the interest rate, what was the number of homes we sold per person. And if you include that period of time in the 1980s when mortgage rates were above 10%, there is, in fact, a relationship. Higher interest rates above 10% do dampen home sales. Does this arrive as a surprise? <laughs> Probably makes sense, right? Okay, so what I did on the right-hand side is all I did is I deleted those six years where the mortgage rates were above 10%. Do you guys, who thinks we're going to see interest rates above 10%? No, not in my lifetime. <laughs> I just don't see it happening. So, the chart on the right is the same chart. We just deleted the high interest rate years over 10%. And that line shows you the statistical relationship between the number of homes we sold each year and the average mortgage interest rate. What do you notice about the line? It's absolutely flat because there's no relationship between mortgage rates and the number of homes you sell if the rates are under 10%. Does that make sense? Yes? Yes, so what uh, she was saying is that uh, home buyers, when rates initially start to go up, they tend to pull back for a minute. And then after a period of time when the rates stabilize, they tend to go back into the market. I think that we've seen that happen a few times. At least I've noticed it a few times since the 12 years I've had a license. But uh, Joe Maskey will be up later, and he'll probably be able to elaborate on that quite a bit. I, th I think that's actually true. Sometimes you see the opposite, though. We, we saw uh, the first initial uh, increase in interest rates a couple years back seemed to like stimulate a little round of activity. And when we talked to the buyers, anecdotally what I heard, it's not like a scientific study, is that, well, we've been expecting rates to go up for a long time. They've been rock bottom for so long. Once it started inching up, we thought, oh my god, we better buy. So I, I could argue either way. I'm not sure what the true right answer is, but great comment. Other comments on this? Yeah. The one factor that seems to be changing a lot is real incomes. Yes. That could have an impact to his interest rates on the other. Have you looked at that at all? I haven't. Um, I've got some slides that I got from uh, Lawrence Yoon. He's the uh, economist for the National Association of Realtors. I sent that out to you guys, I guess, maybe three weeks ago. And there's a couple slides in there that talk about uh, Denver in particular is doing really well for A, creating jobs, and B, creating jobs that pay pretty well. So we're probably going to do a little bit better than the country on average. Um, I didn't dig into this. I looked through this slide. He did such a good job. I couldn't think of anything to ask. Great question. Other questions on this? So Joe's going to talk a little bit uh, when he comes up about increasing interest rates and why buyers keep buying, even if rates increase. So I don't want to steal his uh, talking points on that. Other questions I can answer for you this? I hope this will help you out. If you think of something I can do to modify these slides to make that <coughs> point a little more concisely, let me know, and I'll rework the slides and get the edited version out to you. This is really a very much first round. Okay, so I'm going to actually get on my high horse a little bit about interest rates because this is what drives me crazy about real estate agents. Most real estate agents have absolutely no value to add. So what they say is interest rates are going up so you should buy or sell now. And that is terrible and that's why the world hates real estate agents and that's why you're all here to be able to say something better and more interesting. And that's exactly what Lon just gave you with these new slides and what we've been talking about for years on our trend slide. We do not see any correlation between interest rates and home sales below 10% and thanks for that elucidation. And I'm going to go back to whoever that was, Paul or somebody, show me any data that proves that. You can't and your lender can't. He's going to show you a year or two or a month or two where interest rates went up and people stopped buying and then we can find the same thing on the other side. What I'm trying to say is let's come up with something different and something more interesting to talk about. Let's not be like NAR that predicted that we'd be in 5.5% interest rates right now and why did they do that? Because they were trying to support real estate agents to scare people into buying houses now instead of later. That's the honest truth as I see it. But there's an answer to that. Let's learn some really good, interesting, real statistics to set ourselves apart 
from other real estate agents who have nothing else to talk about except trying to scare people into buying properties because they say interest rates are going to go up. For 10 years, we've been teaching the real estate trends uh, classes and every time someone says I just listened to AM radio and interest rates are about to go up because people like talking about it but we can do a lot better and that's why you're here and I appreciate you learning this stuff. I'll get off my high horse now. <laughs> actually I won't but whatever. Okay so affordability. So actually Terry you brought up something about uh, real income. So did you know I think in the last three months uh, inflation went down? I mean we have so little inflation I think the core inflation rate not including energy and food actually went down. We have very, very low inflation, which is, which supports real income. Obviously, if inflation goes up, real income can go down. But let's look at affordability. It's something to think about because while we see the prices are skyrocketing, <clears throat> it has affected affordability, but it's somewhat different. What we see here, for example, in the like 98 to 2006 area is relatively low affordability. Affordability is defined as the median wage income worker purchasing the median priced home at existing interest rates. You get three variables. So what happened is our homes got very unaffordable because prices were skyrocketing. And then you saw what happened in 2007 and forward. Prices <coughs> went down and of course this is the perfect time to buy. I don't know who bought right here but that would have been the perfect time to buy right there because homes were at all time affordable levels. Why? Because everybody was scared to buy a home. You couldn't get loans. Everybody told you not to buy houses. And the people who timed the market, in this case correctly, they did great because they actually bought here. What's happened over this period of time, the last several years, is that affordability has gone down. And clearly it's gone down a lot. And who wants to be brave? Who thinks that next year homes are going to be more affordable than this year? Anybody? Love to argue that one because I don't think so. I, interest rates aren't going down. Wages aren't going up huge and I don't think prices are going down in the next year. I think most of us agree that things are going to become less affordable. Okay? So, but we're not at this level yet and there's nothing to say that there's anything magical except we were at this level. God, back in the 80s when interest rates were crazy, we actually got very, very unaffordable. But it's another way of looking at it. Everybody looks at just the prices. Look at affordability. So if you've got a buyer who's saying, well, I don't want to buy now, ask them that question. Do you really think homes are going to be more affordable in a year or two? If they do, then fine. You know, let them rent and Lon will jack up his rents and so will I. I think they're going to be wrong. But look at it from an affordability perspective. And this is yet another thing you can talk to your clients about intelligently. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Good. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yes in the back. Yeah, you're saying where do I see the trend going in the next year or two? Down. Well, I think down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the next four years. yeah, I, I think, I mean, for those of us who think we have three or four more years of an upturn, given the very, very low um, uh, uh, properties on the market, by definition, the same thing is low inventory, more demand than supply, prices will then go up, meaning affordability will go down. So the short answer to the question is, I expect this to go down for several more years and then hit a bottom somewhere and then crawl up and then go like that when prices start going down, which eventually they will. Yep. So an easy way to explain that is pretend that mortgage rates do not change at all for the next year. Uh, the average income in Denver goes up 4% and the average home price goes up 4%. So what would be the change in affordability? It would be exactly flat. So if in the next year mortgage rates are exactly flat, incomes go up 4%, but the average home price goes up by 8, what happens to affordability? It goes down, right? Let's imagine that rates go up a little bit, and we have the 4% for income, and we have the 8% for homes. That will happen to affordability. So I think you've got two drivers we can really pretty safely predict home prices are going to go up and it's pretty likely that interest rates will go up and on the offset I also think it's very likely that income will increase even faster than inflation so that not fast enough to offset those other two so I, I have a really high degree of confidence that that line will drift downwards I still think people will buy though because rents are so silly expensive as long as buying makes more sense economically than renting, you shouldn't have the pressure for first-time buyers to want to buy a house. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Okay.
And that's exactly why we're going to talk about the rental market with Eric Ross in a few minutes because one side is the exact opposite of the other side. They, they go in tandem and you can't look at one side without the other but when you see the relationship between the two, people are either going to rent or they're going to buy and it turns out we're not a city like some in Ohio or other places where people leave. People don't leave. We're going to grow by 50,000 a year. So it's either rent or buy and as the rental market continues to get stronger it pushes people to the buying market. But overall we think this is going to go down for several more years and that could be a reason you might want to tell a first time home buyer that you might want to stop renting because do you know what rents increased in the last year? In the last 12 months you know what the rental average rental increase was? 13 percent. Yep, 13 percent. Unbelievable. So it's making this at least a better option which is good for us I suppose. So speaking of that you get a first time home buyer you know just show them the stat. This is from the Fed. You know, you know who has all the money in the country? Homeowners. They do. You buy, you hold, you make money over time. Renters do not have a lot of money. Is that the reason you should buy? Probably not, but the statistics are unbelievably overwhelming. And it's not just this, it's the tax code. So do renters get to write off their rent? No. What do they get to write off? Right. It's actually very skewed towards homeowners. In lots of other countries like Canada and the UK and others, they don't let you write off your interest payment on your home but we do and that's probably not going anywhere at least for the under a million, half a million for a long time in my opinion. Although Congress is looking at it, I don't think that's going to change. So Natalie, what time is it? 39. Okay, so let's go to about 10 o'clock on this. So give me a 10 minute. Okay, so uh, digging deeper into some of the stats here, what you see are these are the smallest homes under 990 square feet up to 1290. And what you see is the smaller homes, just shockingly little inventory. There's just nothing left. And price rises 13% in the tiny ones, 15%, 12%. As you get bigger, it does, it does slow down a little bit. You have a little more inventory, 3,000 feet and larger. And we've seen this for a long time. For years, it's been the smaller homes. As long as I can remember, honestly, where the smaller homes have had Smaller inventory, uh, smaller inventory, tighter days on market, and <coughs> price increases. You know, 70% of the homes in this size range, 990 square feet to 1300, on the MLS are already under contract. Incredibly tight. Yep. So, so I want to start a mental place with your slide. Um, during the downturn, do you guys want to talk about the used car lot and the mix of what you sell for cars in terms of the average price on the lot? Some of you remember that. I want to talk about that briefly with this slide, and then I want to talk about the other rentals because I think it will help to explain why the market behavior the way it is. So, there's not very many of these little houses that are cheap available to sell, right? So, there's lots and lots of the really big houses available to sell, and we are selling more of the big houses than we have a couple of years ago. So, if on our car lot we're not selling very many entry level Hyundais and we're selling a lot of really big Lexuses, what happens to the average sales price of a lot? Goes up. It has to skew upwards. Even if the average price of the Hyundai does not change, and the average price of the Lexus does not change, the average price will go up anyway, just because of the mix of what you get to sell. So when you see that our average home price in Denver is up 12%, is every house in Denver up 12%? Probably about half that is what's really taking place. What you're really seeing for most of that excessive increase in prices that's scaring a lot of people from a bubble standpoint is the mix. And I don't have any cheap houses left to sell. Does that make sense? You're going to see the same thing on the rental slide here. Actually, I don't have a slide, but I'm just going to talk you through the rental market. The 13% increase Charles quoted, the exact same thing. It's a mix change driving a lot of the true numbers of what's going on. We'll talk about that in a second. Juan? Yeah. Do you have any statistics that show average sale price in dollars per square foot? That would be a more... Uh, we uh, we tried doing that, and there were some things that muddied the waters a lot. That I, I could I'm not an economist, so I study finance, uh, so I, I couldn't figure out how to make it work. Um, but you're asking a really good question. When we talk about the average home price in Denver going up six percent a year over the last 45 years, it's a lot because the product that we're building today. What's the average price of a new building? What do you know? Like 440. When you go to the design center, it's probably close to 500 thousand dollars. Is that a one-car garage or a three-car garage? Two, three, Well, outside of two more Denver, it's going to be three. That's Central Air? Yeah. Add granite? Yeah. Stainless? Yeah. 3,000 square feet? Yeah. 
So if you rewind back to 1979, what was the average home that we were building in Denver like that? Who sold a 1979 finished home recently? Just took the one. Tell me about it. How big was it? About 12 square feet, one car garage, probably no air conditioning, probably not a dishwasher, but sure as hell no granite where we built, right? So the product that we build today is way bigger and way more luxurious than the product that we built in 1979. So a lot of the 6% increase in prices over time is the fact that we're selling more Lexuses and a lot less Hyundai. Does that make sense? Well, not that we're selling. We're building. We only build Lexuses now. Nobody builds Hyundai's, right? Does anybody build 1,200 square foot houses? Not this market. Actually, probably we never will again. So that's a little bit of tension. Can I answer your question on that? That's, that's as close as I get to answering it. I'm sorry, we're trying to answer it. Other comments on it? So this is another way of looking at the home prices that we talked about earlier. We saw about 2012, we saw the prices started to rise, 13, and if you've been here for a while, this is the same discussion we had in 13. Prices have gone up too high, when are they going to go down? In 14, same discussion as last year. Prices have gone up, when are they going to go down? 15, they went up even higher. I think we finished at about 424 or so, something like that. I'm going to show you in a slide uh, at the end of July. When are they going to go down? When are they going to go down? Mr. Stegner wants I know, you're the smartest guy in the room. When do you think they're going to go down? Not for a long time. What do you think? Three years, four years, five years? Average? Uh, we're at three years. Yeah, he's there at three years. I mean, that's what a lot of us are thinking. But like I said, I was saying the same thing three years ago. But I'm the smartest guy. So. You are the smartest guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, I know we're, we're both like chomping at the bit to talk about this one. All right, let, let me start. Sit down. Let me get two minutes on this because <laughs> turn, I, I can turn you off. I have the master switch. It's just like this at home too. So. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're, this is really interesting because we started by talking about the last month or two we've been hearing people say, Three offers, not 13, that kind of thing, but we didn't have any data. And this right here is one of two pieces of data that we have that says, okay, maybe we're slowing down a little bit. So what you see here is the average number of showings per active listing per month. So back in the downturn, 09, 10, you were getting six or seven showings per listing per month. So if you had a city of 10 listings and there were 100 showings, it would have been 10. It doesn't mean anything except 12 is more than 10, 8 is less than 10. So what you saw, remember 2012, we saw the price rise? Well, right here, we knew it was coming at least a few months in advance because all of a sudden people were looking at houses. And there was either more people looking, the numerator, or fewer properties on the market, the denominator. And since then, it's just gone up and up and up, right? Here's 2013, went up. 2014, unbelievable. 2015, this is what our spring looked like. Crazy, crazy numbers. And then we just got this. So long, what does that mean? <laughs> so a couple thoughts. If you've got a pen and you want to scribble in July, it's just a little bit less than June, but above the number for 2014. So it did decline a little bit further. Um, so I guess the, the main point I want to bring up, if you take a look at the number for 2012, it's a relatively steady number of showings for active listing across the entire year. You guys all see that? Yeah. Something changed in 2013 where the first quarter in April had a lot more showing traffic and then it leveled out for the rest of the year. What do you see in 2014? Same pattern. What do you see in 2015? Same pattern. If you remember actually exactly a year ago when you're sitting in this room for the summer, we had this all the same discussion. But it wasn't as animated because we didn't have as severe of a change. But there was a change, which is not as dramatic. If you remember back two years ago, when it was really abrupt, the dotted green line where April was like amazingly high that it fell off really, really quick, we had the discussion then as well. I think this is becoming like a seasonal pattern. I can't prove it, but what I think is happening is that this media generated mindset of scarcity for home buyers in our market has prompted a lot of people who would normally buy in the summer to start their search earlier. So they're getting out there with us because we're pegging them on saying, hey, we want to make sure we find you a house for summer. Let's start earlier than we would have normally. They're out there in late February, March because they got their tax returns filed so they can get 
give them to their lender, they probably got their tax returns back, which is part of their down payment because they're a first time buyer. And if you take a look at March, April, they're out there competing really hard. So that's the demand side. But meanwhile, on the supply side, nothing about the fundamentals about when people decide to change, sell their house has really changed. When, when people sell their house in the summer? Curb appeal. Partially curb appeal, what else? The school gets out. So some number of years from now, when I get my littlest kid out of the house finally, I'm not going to be able to sell my house in February. I'll have to sell my house in June, right? And I don't really have any electives around that because the school schedule dictates to me as a seller what I'm allowed to do. So all the supply comes on when? May, June, July, and the buyers are looking earlier. So you get the supply demand mismatch in spring. I think that's what's happening. Maybe Charles can offer this up. Yeah, Josh. I think one other thing that might be contributing to this, and I don't have any idea how much, but Agent behavior is changing a lot because we've had such a big run up. Yep. How, we're all getting phone calls. Do you have offers already? Right. You know, and we're all putting stuff in the MLS like all offers will be reviewed on Monday. Everybody's starting to list on Thursdays. So we're seeing a lot. I'm, I could get a lot more showings on my listing, but at a certain point, I'm just telling agents, we're already 20,000 over asking, and I have conventional loans with 35% down. Yep. And, and I, then yeah, a whole bunch of showings don't happen because of those phone calls. So. I think that could definitely be a piece of it. Charles? So what John was saying is because the days on market have gone down, and, and he's saying, hey, you know, I don't want a 15th offer, this, that actually masks this. This is actually would be a lot higher if our days on market were longer. It's because the market is so strong, it's literally keeping this number somewhat down. The thing I find very interesting is that was just a shockingly high percentage of showings per listings. And this is a really deep drop. And to me, what that's saying is, yeah, maybe the market is cooling just a little bit, like John said up front. Now, we're just going to have to see what this brings over time. But I'm looking here, and I'm looking like that's a lot like 13 and 14, which was really strong, but it wasn't like the winter and the spring of 2015. Kenneth. <coughs> a lot of buyers hit some fatigue in the spring because they kept making offers and getting beat out and they said, you know, I, I need to take a break here. And, uh, maybe they'll yeah, he's saying, is there buyer fatigue? Yeah. How do I prove that? I don't know. Is that why that happened? I mean, it'd be easy to say yes. I don't know. That's as good an answer as anything else I can think of. I don't know, but you know, are your buyers fatigued? Yeah. I mean, a lot of buyers are fatigued, so it's entirely possible. Yeah. Yes, um, Jorge. Basically ask the same thing. Yeah. So we'll see where this goes. We will see where this goes. My, oops, sorry. My guess is we're probably going to stick along here where 13 and 14 is for a while. But this is very, very important to understand and to communicate to your buyers and your sellers to let them know it wasn't your fault you couldn't find them a property if they were buyers back in the winter and the, and the spring. It was incredibly, incredibly difficult. But now maybe you want to make a phone call and say, hey, you know, I heard you were fatigued a few months ago. My buddy Kenan told me you were fatigued a couple of months ago. <laughs> but now, now maybe it's an opportunity because we know something that we think nobody else knows because nobody else tracks these numbers. So I, I have no idea, but what if next year looks like the same pattern as this year? If you thought that was likely, what would you tell your clients? Why now? Why now? <laughs> and if they were an elective seller who wasn't tied to a school district seller, why don't you tell them the list? <laughs> well, list now, of course, that's always the <laughs> But remember, I think it's really the right answer. So we've got a couple of condos that we don't like a lot that we're thinking about maybe pairing from the portfolio, and we're going to list it in March. March looks like a good time, doesn't it? Yep. So it's just, I don't know, it may not be worth a lot, but it's something fun to talk about. Certainly nobody else has the facts behind it to have like that kind of discussion. There's got to be some value to that. And that's exactly what I think so much of the value of this. So you guys, a lot of you have done Ninja with Monica. 
uh, and gone up to Fort Collins. Something interesting to talk about, to make your ninja calls and not just say, hi, how's your summer, etc. Start with that, but to be able to relay some interesting information. I think this is really, really interesting information that you can begin building a relationship and having an excuse, make an excuse to make 10 phone calls over the next five days, something like that with something like this because nobody else has seen this, nobody else has this data. It's a reason for you to be in touch with your clients. That's what this is all about. Any last questions on this? Hope you think it's as interesting as I do because this was very, very interesting for me. So right here, uh, again, we have the showings per active listing. Now this doesn't show the last couple of months. This shows up to June, but not July. Uh, this is second quarter only. Oh, this is just second quarter only, okay. But what you see is over time, from 2012 to 2015, you just had this huge jump, just like we saw on the previous slide. And when people say, well, I don't really care about everybody else's homes, I want to talk about my $300,000 home. I mean, look at that, 25 showings, you know, one a day for, for, uh, for properties in that price range. So, you know, maybe one talking point you can get out of this is, is the market slower in the second quarter than it was in the first quarter? Absolutely. Um, is this second quarter better than last second quarter? By a little or a lot? By a lot. By a lot, right? We sold a few more homes. Prices went up a lot. Might be because of mixed change, but it doesn't really matter from the consumer's point of view. But the short traffic sure is healthy, right? So I think this is something you can use that you can show them that even though the market is softened, that doesn't mean as a buyer that you can write a careless offer, right? We still have to write real offers. So we all got maps. Everybody will get maps on the way out. Lots of great data here, uh, breaking it down by city. So let's talk a little bit about one of the special things about Denver and why I don't think we're looking at a downturn anytime soon. It's because a whole bunch of us in this room and in this city aren't from Denver and we chose to live here and we could have lived a lot of different places and we chose Denver because it's such a wonderful place to live. This is data showing what we expect for a population increase over the next 10 years. Now, you can complain about it, but as a real estate agent or a property owner, it's actually a good thing from that side. And what we see is that we're expecting about 50,000 larger population per year. This right here is the natural increase, which is births over deaths, maybe 20,000 or so. And then you expect about 30,000 additionally. And these people need to live somewhere. And this slide, the next couple slides, in a little bit, we're going to talk about from a rental perspective. And remember, the rental market and the housing market, they go hand in hand. But it's really simple. Where are all these people going to live? That's a real question. Yeah, I don't know either. But what they're going to do is they're going to bid up the rental prices and the home prices for the time being. There's no question about it. So this right here is another way of looking at the demand that we're going to see for housing. What we see here is that we have a generation of millennials who more than the previous generation have lived at home for whatever reason, lots of good reasons for it, whatever you want to say. But not only do we have an increased population of about 50,000 per year, but we've got a lot of people in their 20s that we do expect at some point to move out. Where are they going to go? They're either going to rent or they're going to buy, putting yet additional pressure on the demand for rentals or purchases. I don't know where they're going to go. We can make lots of speculation on what percent, but what we're seeing here is that unlike previous generations, you have a lot of people in their 20s who haven't rented or bought yet, and they're going to start coming out of the woodwork over time. So two points maybe you could use this with, uh, for a client. So the 36% of our millennials, 850,000, 30% of them live at home. This is 300,000 people. So we sold about 50,000 homes last year. So the millennials living in their parents' basement represent six years of sales just on their own. <laughs> Think about that, right? So in a normal city that isn't experiencing high growth in a more established city like, kind of like Boston or Chicago, what you would notice is that there would be a lot more people in the silent generation, and your baby boomer cohort would be a little bit bigger. But the number of natives in the city is relatively small, 
relative to the number of people who moved here like me. So we're skewed to a much younger average age in Denver than a place like Chicago or Boston. Does that make sense? If you're in a more balanced demographically market like Chicago, you expect the silent generation guys to be moving into nursing homes and assisted living at about the same pace that millennials are moving out of the basements. So there's a supply demand balance. Does that make sense? We do not have that in this market. I think that's an important talking point. I don't know what you're going to be talking about. That these guys don't have any houses to give up because there just aren't that many of them. Which means all 300,000 of these millennials will need to have new construction, really. Does that make sense? It is a lot of construction. Very exciting if you're a builder. Does that make sense? Okay, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, questions? Open it up to the floor. What do we miss? I know this is just a part of it. We teach trends classes all the time, so come to that CE credit and stuff. But anything you want to talk about, anything you want to ask about? Yeah. Hey. What about raw land? What about raw land? So, uh, raw land and the outskirts. I've got a bunch of land in Elbow County. <laughs> <laughs> raw land. Honestly, I don't know a darn thing about raw land. Anybody? Anybody? Raw land? I guess we talk about raw for a little longer. You're the path target for me, I live long enough. Wow. So we've got a chart, we showed this in kind of harsh. Uh, meeting back, where we showed the uh, <laughs> metro, like the 470 sort of a loop, and then we showed by decade where all the construction took place, like in 1890, it's like all of the core of the city around downtown, and then each successive decade, of, like there's these little concentric donuts that go out. Does that make sense? So we've gone about as far west as we can get, so really all the progressive building going forward is going to be south, east, and north, right? But if you take a look at those 11 or 12 decade slides and look at where the new construction been each decade, it's like pretty obvious what's going to happen for the next 40 years here. This is the donuts just continue to go out, just except for the west side, so it's a clip donut. Or we're going to take a side on it. Um, so for you, eventually, it'll get south enough that you'll build it just kind of how far south you are. Okay, last question. So, um, Juan, you said millennials are going to need new builds. Ooh. What price point? I mean, I'm just going to assume. Well, I wouldn't say they need new builds. I don't think they can afford them. So, there's all these surveys of what millennials want. Well, when I was 22, I wanted a Ferrari and I wanted to live in a pet house. That would be cash for me either. So, you can survey it all you want. It doesn't mean they can buy it. They'll, they'll, they'll get what they can afford. And the reality is they'll find that a lot of roommates a lot harder than they anticipated. I don't know if I'm asking a question, though. Yeah, it's a long thing. I don't think we'll do any millennials who will get to buy new construction unless they're like a control engineer, married to like a nurse. And then they can buy one of my fancy replacements of 